In a book called Engineering in the Mind's Eye by Eugene Ferguson, he emphasizes that modern engineering has depended heavily and continuously on nonverbal learning and nonverbal understanding. These are three pages from the notebooks of Thomas Edison. In Edison, we have a perfect example. He drew as he thought in order to make his ideas come to life. I could say a picture is worth a thousand words, but I'm a college professor, so instead I'll say, there are levels of meaning made available by the act of drawing and seeing that go far deeper than the levels of meaning communicated by words. My own personal theory is that music is the first language because we hear before we can see. Drawing is the second language because we see before we can read or speak. And writing is the third language, the most removed, because it happens later. In the first lecture in this series, I talked about the emergence of the exactly repeatable pictorial image as a powerful new tool in human communication, and in the second, I talked about using images in industry as the work orders and specifications for human actions. In this last lecture, I will talk about some of the other ways visual communication has become an integral part of our culture. It's part of a thought process, it's codified invention as manifested in patents, it's images and letters, it's a tool in problem solving, it can contain collected knowledge, and it can act as self-reification. I will even define the word reification. This drawing was included with a letter in which the author said that, since he didn't have any time to get a professional drawing made, he'd include a sketch of the changes they were making in an open hearth furnace. On the back of the letter, the recipient made another sketch and then used mathematical calculations to check to see if the furnace could generate enough heat. In this exchange, we can see that making and trading sketches is faster than words and can convey a level of physical meaning that words can't. This is an official printed drawing of a furnace used at Bethlehem Steel that someone has marked up and made further drawings on. It was probably the basis of a conversation. Although there were no words attached to it, you can easily imagine someone saying, you see, they do it like that, scratch, 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 and we could do it like this. This is another example of an informal back-of-the-envelope type communication. On a letterhead from an unrelated organization, someone started a sketch and continued it on the other side. There are documents like this strewn throughout the Lucan's archives. Even though most of the drawings are not accompanied by verbal descriptions, the owners felt that they were important enough to save, and thus we have them today. Patents are a codification of the drawing slash thought process. After inventors work out details, experiment, and make specifications, if they have something new, they can take out a patent on it. Perhaps patents are thoughts reified, made real within the social order. U.S. patents predictably began with drawings and then had text to explain the drawings and provide further information. William Ivins wrote, Communication is absolutely necessary for scientific and especially technological development, and to be effective it must be accurate and exactly repeatable. This is the image from the first page of a patent. The remainder of the patent was a page and a third of text. The text begins by stating the purpose of the patent and then describing the accompanying drawing in detail. Large and small letters are mapped from the text to the drawing to aid the reader's understanding. Ivins wrote, Techniques and technologies can only be effectively described by written or printed words when they are accompanied by adequate demonstrative pictures. And this is an example. The combination of drawing and writing together is a powerful tool and can explain large complex machinery across centuries and across borders. In the Lucan Steel archives, even the 19th century letter books contained drawings, sometimes embedded within the text, sometimes as separate documents. Such examples are easy to find. Here is one from 1885, an official drawing sent in conjunction with a letter. 
By the turn of the century at Luke and Steele, the workers began to communicate in drawing and writing as well, joining the company owners in the ongoing exchange of Cheerio graphic, Cheerio hand, graphic pen, knowledge. The workers also began to write and draw. Images were also essential in problem solving. This letter describes a cracked roll in the mill, first in detailed writing, and then with a photograph of the end of the cracked roll, and then a blueprint of chemical tests done to the iron in various parts of the roll. All of this information was necessary to track the source of the problem and then to solve it or to keep it from happening again. Drawings can also function as a repository of knowledge. This small beat-up notebook came from a different company than Lucan's, and yet they saved it anyway. Why? On its pages were hundreds of detailed drawings of machine parts, mainly screws, nuts, and bolts. It was knowledge, pure and simple, stored on paper. Reification means making something real, not just physically real, like making an object and setting it on the table, but making it real within our culture. Lucan's kept a low profile with the outside world during its early years because they knew their customer base. However, as time passed and competition increased, they needed to let the outside world know that they existed and that they made certain objects. Thus, they began doing advertising and public relations. These are two drawings of boiler parts that were in a self-promotional booklet. At first, they used drawing, but soon they used photography to show the parts that they were capable of creating. Thus, their existence as a manufacturer was reified within the larger industrial society. Once they began creating self-promotional images, they had a good time with it, producing stunning photographs of odd shapes. I still have no idea what this is. Lucans did not just use images to make themselves real with the outside world, however. They also photographed many of the plant employees and in so doing strengthened the relations within the plant. This is the manager of human relations staging a hiring. They tried to photograph all of their workers, thus bringing them together into a cohesive unit. Later, in the years I did not research, they had a monthly journal called Lucan's Life, which was about the plant and its employees. Returning to the theme of my first lecture in this series, the revolution in visual communication, which has been so pervasive that we can barely see it, evolved hand in hand with industrial technology. They're inseparable. Drawing and seeing is another way of communicating, as powerful as, if not more powerful than, words. Look for it in your daily life. See where and when you use it, and use it to your advantage.